Hey guys, welcome along to this episode of Runners Only with Tom Harvey. Um, a bit different to the normal episode, this is a New Zealand exclusive first and foremost. Uh, yesterday in New Zealand, news came out that Zane Robertson, one of the uh, greatest New Zealand distance runners of all time, and Commonwealth Games bronze medalist, had been um, had tested positive for the drug EPO and had received a seven year ban. Four years for taking the drug EPO and three years for then trying to cover it up. Um, he is based in um, Iten in Kenya and he spoke exclusively to us on the Runners Only podcast. Um, I normally like to do these interviews face to face but Kenya's a long way away so we did this online um, but this is Zane's side of the story on Runners Only with Dom Harvey. Zane Robertson, so it's less than 24 hours here in New Zealand since the news came out. How are you? Um, obviously not a great day for me. Uh, I have known this news would come out and I have known for the last few months, so well, since, since September last year. So it's been a pretty depressing, devastating day for me. And your, your phone must have been blowing up. Um, what's the sort of tone of the messages? Is it you know, mainly support from people that know and love you or is there like scorn from you know, people that are just outraged by what's happened? Thankfully, my inbox system on Instagram does support me and it's only people that are close to me. And from what I've seen, 80% has been really supportive and just caring about me as a human first and not an athlete. And a lot of these people have known me for years, so they do understand the circumstances and situations that I've faced um, a lot of it the 20 other 20 percent of the rest of it has been scorn and just people trying to shame me and make me feel horrible and I tell you what I've I've felt horrible myself for a long time even before this um, drug case came about yeah um, I suppose the, the the big question uh, it's actually a very short question but it's a it's a very big one at the same time why Yeah, so the, the why, there's many reasons, and it's not just one particular reason. And and I hate it so much that, um, you know, it's it's just a one-off hit, and I got caught. And I it's, it's, been a, it's been building on me for a few years. Frustration and anger at the sport itself. And at any, any elite sport, I just believe the top is... It's not a level playing field like they say. And why do people like myself, I started to ask myself this question, why do people like myself always have to be the ones to lose or suffer and in the end lose our contracts, lose our income, lose our race winnings and eventually end up not having the ability to have a family or um, live anywhere else in the world from the predicaments we're in. That was one reason. The other reason, well, uh, especially after COVID, the COVID era, prize money and races went down. Contracts were almost um, dropped as well. After the Olympics, I was told by one of my companies, uh, we thought you'd run better mm -hmm. and immediate exit from the, from the deal. The other company was holding on just to the bare minimum I had pressure from my management. I was constantly getting injured in the race shoes that I was trying to develop. And nothing was seeming to just go my way. I had a lot of background noise away from the running world as well. With After the COVID era, living in New Zealand for a while, I spent a lot of my life savings on just trying to survive and what was in the savings account. I was providing for myself and my um, wife at the time. After the, we left New Zealand, we already knew we were going, through, going to go through a divorce period. And it was a nasty divorce proceeding. And some, some things led to, led to another. And a lot of stress was placed on me. And I, I, made, a, I made some bad decisions in a really dark yeah. place. So... 
So talk us through um, EPO. Um, most of us have no idea what it means. You hear EPO, you think Lance Armstrong and the Tour de France. What, what exactly is EPO and, and what does it do? Because you were a bloody fast runner even without it. Yeah, so it's a, it's a simplistic thing. It's even naturally occurring. I've learned a lot more about this through my just through my recent studies and everything but um we have it naturally in the body and when you add it synthetically it helps the red blood cells to develop more in the body and that that produces more oxygen to be pushed around the body so you can let's say run faster for longer without feeling it okay so say can you try and put in some terms that like regular people listening to this would understand? So say the, the half marathon distance, for example, 21.1 Ks. Say there's someone listening to this that um, can run a half marathon in two hours. If they took EPO, what, what could they do afterwards? Uh, well, really, it com and completely, it's different for everyone, I guess. I, I haven't used, I didn't use it long enough to know the real effects. And I, I, the one time I took it, I did feel that I could f move in training like I was in great shape and, and clearly I wasn't in great shape before it. It just makes you feel a lot easier when you're pushing at your maximum for a lot longer. So it, I guess it could have the effect on training like over a long period of time as well that it's it's helping recovery it's helping you train harder longer many more days such effects it might take one minute off someone's time it might take zero minutes off it could take 10 minutes off if they're at two hours it's it's probably different for everyone but i'm not a scientist so i can't say what would you say to people that are listening to this that go well you lied about this. Why should we believe you now? Well, I have been tested over 50 times in my career. And after every single race that I've ever competed well in, I've been tested before the races, after the races. And my samples can be, um, they are stored for the next 10 years after the events. So um, 10 years is a long time. And once new technology and new tests are becoming available, they're retested again. So there's been no problems with my my past samples. And I guess that's just the evidence side of it. Yeah. yeah. But... Um, and what's the like, what, what's the process with EPO? So you you decide um, you decide you need this edge or you need some you know some sort of advantage. Where, where do you where do you go? How, who do you start the conversation with? Is it someone that you train with that you know is taking it? Is it a chat with a doctor? Like how does it start? Oh well, for my case, it was very unique and it's very different. Um, my my. Um, it, my ex-wife and I, we started talking about this thing a while, like a few years back, because I was frustrated with the sport already. And it kept building the more, the more I just saw and the more I learned and the more I knew. People I used to know and I still know. And I just was getting my ass handed to me in every race. And I just kept asking how and how is this possible? How is this happening now? And we started talking about it a lot and um, one day she showed up back to the house with it and and it stayed in the house for a very long time. And when I moved, when I finally did move to Kenya, I, I, I moved with it. I moved with some of my stuff over the side and it, again, it stayed in my house for a very long time until, yeah, I mean... But but just in, in general, in general, day to day, I can't say too much because of my situation and where I live, man. And you you understand that. It's it's a culture of sport. That's it. Yeah, if it is, um, 
If it is part of the culture of a sport, and in particular high performance sport, why is it that so few people get caught? Sadly, sadly, man, it's um, I'm not sure why that is. I have no evidence mm. why that is. I do know it's a very hard drug to detect, very, very hard, because the body produces it naturally. So the difference between the two, the natural and synthetic, are not that different. And um, doctors are always ahead of the game one step. Um, people are always, you know, when money's involved, people are always evolving yeah. to make more money. So sport, sport is also a business. Yeah. So, so you got caught after a um, run in May 2022 at Manchester. Um, so you, you complete the run, then you go into a testing room, provide a urine sample. Uh, what, talk, us, what, talk us through what happens after that. Well, once I've done that, then um, they leave with my samples, and I was I was free to go, just walk around normal, do my thing. I was notified last year in September when I was in Sydney at the to actually pace the marathon, and um, I obviously was in a lot of shock and stress. And just not knowing what to do. So I didn't sleep all night. I, I performed as a pacemaker there and I performed poorly. Um, obviously, people who know that stress can lead to poor performance yeah. physically. Um, I, was, I was suffering a long time before this even happened. But I guess, I guess you'll get to that. Um, so once I found out in Sydney, then the next proceedings were to get a lawyer and see what my options are. Yeah, because your, your banning sort of came in uh, two parts. There's uh, four years um, banning for the EPO and then additional years tagged on the end for trying to cover it up. Was um, the, the cover-up idea, is that something that's commonly done in Kenya or was that your lawyer's idea? Was that your idea? Um... I, I want to take full blame for that as well. That was my idea. T to me, four years is the same as eight. It's the end of my career. It, there's no coming back from this, and I knew. So I was just trying to save my ass, and I want people to think, like, really deeply think. If, if that was them, if they had invested, like, 16 years into trying to be a professional... Um, and they were going to lose their career because of one fuck up. Then I, I guess that I guess a lot of people would try and save their ass, and that's just what I tried to do. Yeah. Oh, and no, I, I fully understand you. Um, there's a guy called um, Peter Fitzinger. I don't know if you know the name, but he's um, the Athletics New Zealand Chief Executive. Um, he had a, he had a quote yesterday yeah. saying, "It's hard to know what would lead the athlete to make a, the series of decisions he did." Um, how would you respond to that? Um, he's speaking from a professional standpoint. He can't say, well, he hasn't lived in the professional running world for a while. And he wasn't, he was a professional runner himself, but I mean, it, I made a bad decision, and I, I'm I'm paying the price for it, and I I understand that this is what you get. Try try being me. Try being um, 16 years in this sport and um, not having a lot to show for it, but also realizing that you can't move back to, back home to New Zealand ever. You can't maybe have a family ever because you can't provide enough and if sports your only source of income and you're running out of income options covid's wiped out the prize money yeah. theory and the appearance money theory then you you what do you have left um i mean it's it's a to it's a terrible situation that i was in but that's and 
there were a lot of things that led up to that as well, like um, like my depression and um, just making me make bad decisions. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I, I asked you at the very beginning of this chat the, your why, and um, I, I think my just following your your story and your brother's story quite closely over the years. I think like my why would be pro probably slightly different. Um, on behalf of you guys, like someone said to me yesterday, why would he do it? My why went something like this. I, I said, these guys have spent more time in Kenya than what they've spent in New Zealand. Like they were, they were, they were bullied at school, um, not just by peers, but by teachers and stuff as well. And they had a taste of success in running and they saw a gateway out of this and to make something of themselves. So they left Hamilton, New Zealand as teenagers, went to Kenya, put everything on the line against their parents' wishes, um, were living on <laughs> jam sandwiches, you know, had malaria at the same time and just about died and were waking up in the night in cold sweats checking on each other. And you do put so much into this thing and get so far uh, over so many years and uh, you're just looking for that extra little edge. So even, I'm not, not justifying what you've done because it's, it's bad and we all know it's bad. Um, but I can, I can understand your wife from an empathetic point of view, bro. Yeah, I think, I think that's another reason, um, our upbringing, my, there were a lot of things that weren't normal, a lot of things that didn't go right. And I think that's why when I got depressed, I started talking to a psychiatrist in the high performance sports system and. He helped me through a lot of things. Um, I wanted to die. I didn't want to live anymore. And I didn't know why I was doing the sport anymore. And I think that would have been just the right time to maybe try and find something else to do and retire. Unfortunately, we don't always make the right decisions. And um, sadly, as a professional athlete, we're always really in the public eye and just judged for these decisions and mistakes that we make and then um, called out for them in, in horrible ways. So um, I'm trying to deal with this in the best way possible right now. And I still don't know what that is, but I'm just trying to make, I'm just trying to make it yeah, right. Mentally, yeah. how's your headspace at the moment? Not not good to be honest. Today um, today was one of my worst days. Um, if I'm going to be totally honest, I coming home from my brother's place today, I just wanted to go and shoot myself in the head. Yeah. Man, that's rough. Yeah, I mean, this is going to pass, though. This is this is going to pass. These, um, yeah, yeah. You just have to hang in there, right? Have you, you got? Yeah, you got good support and, networks um, over there. Not really. Um, my brother's a little bit pissed off too because I know, and this was the worst thing for me because I knew that it won't just be affecting me. It will affect him. It will affect my sister-in-law, his wife, because they're both athletes. And I don't. I just don't know, like how to how to help or how to do anything anymore. Yeah, this, this is your brother Jake, who's also a phenomenal runner. And I, I must say, um, on all the uh, media footage that's been shown in New Zealand over the last twenty-four hours. It's generally runs where you guys are together in the black singlet. <laughs> so I, I suppose just by association, he's sort of being tarred with the same brush, which is um, which is unfair, of course. It's it's very unfair. I mean, if if one student in a classroom cheats, are they all cheating? Just because they're all in that same classroom. It's it's that's it's bullshit, and people will want to do that to him, and they've already started posting on his wall today, and 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 it's horrible, man. It's it's just terrible. 
Yeah, a bit of empathy would go a long way. I mean, um, <laughs> like I, I can see it on your face. Like you, you've made a you've made a bad mistake. You recognise that, but you, you're you're paying the ultimate price now. The last thing you need is strangers like messaging you telling you you've made a terrible mistake. I think. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I already know it, and I'm I'm going to pay the price for that, and and. Thankfully, I have received a lot of a lot of people out there just reaching out to me, and and then normally it's the people that I have met before in my life somewhere in the last ten years or sixteen years, and I've always been real with them, and I've always discussed sometimes even these topics with them in a real way, with my real opinions, and I think that's why they uh, they really understand me at this point, and they're telling me things like. Um, just um, I'll always be here for you, man. Uh, no matter what, so um, take it easy on yourself. Yeah. And you know, I, I understand where you came from, and it's horrible to see this happen to you. It we know you made a mistake, but we're we're just here for you. Things like this. Yeah. Oh, that's good advice. So you won a um uh, a bronze medal uh, in the five thousand meters at the 2014 Commonwealth Games. Um, so you were completely clean then. Yeah. Yes. So what happens with that medal? You don't get stripped of that. That's still yours for life and the title remains. That is impossible um, to just strip me yeah. of that medal. That was a very long time ago. I yeah, mean, nine years. Um, I mean, see, it's nine years. My sample should still be there. If if they want to go and retest it, go and retest it. Go and retest all of my samples. I, I know this costs money, but if they really want to, they can do it. They can go right ahead. And I have nothing to hide from my past, from all my national records, from all my past achievements. Um, they can they can go ahead and test. Yeah. And um, you've got some other records as well. The New Zealand record holder in the half marathon with a blistering sub-60, 59.47. Um, you've got the marathon record, 2 hours, 8, 19 seconds. And um, what happens to them? Do they remain? Yeah, everything remains. Um, the, only, the only drug test I've ever failed is the one from Manchester. And I placed 11th in the race. I was I was actually very sick before heading to the race. I I don't know if the guy. I mean, obviously, I'm not. I wasn't myself. I wasn't making good decisions in my in my normal headspace. Um, but yeah, the marathon record and the half marathon record. I was tested in the Gold Coast after the race. I was tested in Marugami in Japan after the race immediately and I produced samples both times within within 30 minutes of the race so there was no delay um there was not nothing wrong with the procedure yeah now th they they played a clip on um the New Zealand media uh last night here in New Zealand from the um 2016 Rio Olympics um where you talked about doping and it's always going to be one of these things that's going to come back up again um you you were completely clean at the time, and you you absolutely meant what you said back then. It this is where I, I was just telling you about how I was mm. real with people and talking to them about sometimes even this topic, and and it and it was part of my frustration over the last sixteen years in the sport. Like, firstly, I didn't understand it at all, and. I didn't know how deep it went, but the more I went along in my career, the more I saw of just how it is. And and it can really destroy someone. Like, it can break them down to their knees and think, why them? Why not me? And until I just I just couldn't take it anymore, and, and I had enough. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, and then, so 33 years old now, um, so it's career ending, right? So by the time the band finishes, you're late 30s, early 40s? I, I think I'll be yeah. 39, 40 when it ends. I mean, technically speaking, I 
could actually come yeah. back and run a great marathon. I think a 40-year-old can run 2.5, 2.6. But um, by then, I hope to be in another place. I just, I don't, I don't think there's a, there's a return from here. That's why I said four and eight years is the same thing. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, now that you mention it, I mean, um, a, an athlete that comes to mind is um, the New Zealand multi-sport legend Cameron Brown, who's 50 and has just retired from competing at the top level. Um, I mean, and ultra marathons do seem to favour yeah, the, old, the older sort of athletes. So I, th- I feel it's, it's entirely unwritten and it's entirely up to you what you want to do. Um, I know a few 40 year olds that have just, or 40 plus year olds that have just run under 60 for half marathon, um, that have just run 204, 206 marathons as well. So there is no age limit to, to, um, endurance sport, which is lucky depending on how you treat your body and what you eat and your nutrition and how you live as well. So but it's also very, it's also a huge mind, mental sport, I guess. If you lose it mentally, if you lose the love for it, and I just feel like that's what happened to me. I lost the love for it um, at the professional end. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't the Zane that I used to know. And I still love running. I still love running at the club level or the, at the fun runner level. Um, and I still love running every day, but I just did not like the professional um, event yeah. anymore. Um, you, you just backtracking, you said a moment ago you, you hope to be in a different place by the time the ban ends. Like, what do, what do you mean exactly? Like, just in a completely different sort of field, or? Um, I'm yeah. not sure right now. To be honest, I didn't think much past today. Yeah. Uh, just taking it a day at a time right now. Yeah, no, I understand that. How's the family back in New Zealand? Are they still in Waikato? Um, they're, yeah. they're everywhere. Uh, we move. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of them have heard my stories over the years as well. So they, they really, um, they sympathise with the why and the frustration and just how I've been living for the last the last years and um, they they do they do get it they definitely mm. get it. Yeah, well, you you told me um, that this news was coming out a couple of weeks ago on WhatsApp when we got talking. So I'm guessing your your parents have known this for a while. Can you can you take us back to that phone call when you told them that this was going to happen? That must have been one of the hardest calls you've ever had to make. Um, it, it was, it was difficult, but probably the, the hardest call, one of the hardest calls was, um, the the first one, which I actually had to make from Sydney back to, back to Kenya. Um, and just recently as well, just, um, having to tell my brother because I know most most affected from this will be my family, my close family over here. And um, that was probably the hardest thing. Yeah, how was he? How did he take it? Now you can you can imagine um, because he has he has two emotions about it. you know he has the same frustration as me. And the same anger as me, but then at the same time, he ha- he understands that this will indirectly affect him as well, and and then he wants to feel bad for me as well, but he he also wants to hate me for it. So I think he's going to he's going to suffer like from this a little bit as well. Um, just I need to give him some time. And um, another another phone call that I'm guess I, I don't know if this was even a phone call or an email or how this works in high performance sport, but um, you were an ASICS runner. Did you have to tell them? Um, I'm I'm guessing they uh, dropped you as quickly as what they could. Um, no, actually, I was dropped before. I was dropped before this happened. Um, 
it was actually one of the most motivating factors as well that I just knew and I was being pressed by people in the management and people in the company in the shoes weren't working for me and I hadn't been running well for like three years because of constant injuries I couldn't finish a race without blowing my Achilles and my calf out and it was it was just all underlying factors of um in the end like which made me make make this mistake yeah yeah I, I get it it's like a sense of desperation like you you sort of do anything i guess to do the best you can and preserve your career i think if there's a word for it yes desperation um desperation definitely comes mm. to mind um the olympics for me was a was a big one a huge one because i invested a lot of my time and money and my own effort into preparing for that preparing for the conditions the heat um it, even though i was in like um <laughs> i don't know it's not really witness protection or something but um i did have threats on my life at that time own? from the uh, uh, threats on my life from the ongoing divorce and extortion and um, such, but that's another okay. story and I don't want to get into it. Um, it was pretty nasty, so I had to, I had to move up to my farm in the mountains and kind of hide out for months. And uh, um, so dealing with stress and on all angles again, I think it just. It didn't do me well. So as I mentioned before, you've spent more time in Kenya now than what you've actually spent in New Zealand um, because you and your brother left when you were in your late teens. Um, what, what happens now? Are you going to stay there? Is Kenya your home now or do you need to come back to New Zealand to heal? I am not sure. I am not sure right now. I think... I think it's a lot easier for me to disappear here than in New Zealand. So if I can just disappear, I will. Um, uh, I haven't put much thought to it yet. Um, I think my, my visa situation here will run out eventually. So I'll definitely need to go somewhere but I'm not sure where that yeah. somewhere is yet. Um, one of the uh, big questions that, it, that seems to be raised here is um, just the fear of this embarrassing New Zealand on the world stage. Like, What are your thoughts on that? Do you think this embarrasses New Zealand on the world stage? I think, I think, uh, I think it doesn't embarrass New Zealand. I think, the, I think all elite sport this is like and elite athletes across all sports must know this and this is sad sad truth it's just now become part of the game and i think new zealand's reputation is really at the high end of not doing it um but it's like it also depends on what sport you're in and what you're doing so I don't think I don't think it's embarrassing to New Zealand as a nation. No, I think there's bigger things out there to focus on than mm. sport. Yeah, what about regrets? Like, how do you how do you get past this now? How do you how do you forgive yourself and rebuild your life? I mean, you, you are you are yeah, Zane Robertson, a man. Yeah, running was what you did, but it, it's not necessarily what defines you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think I think a lot of the people who have met me over the years know that, and they that's why they've reached out to me today with, in such kind ways. They didn't just message me with some horrible things. Um, I think the best way for me to move past this is by staying with the people who are the closest to me and just trying to work on myself as well, just to just to realize that this was a mistake and I've already done it since September last year. I don't think I can do it anymore. And, um, 
I mean, I'm already as sorry as I can be to like the, to the sport, to everyone else who probably believed in me and um, might still, some of them might, might not. But um, yeah, I'm not looking for sympathy. I just kind of wanted to tell my story and let people try to understand that the situation, the circumstances I w- was in yeah. wasn't so great. So I'm going to work on myself and stay close yeah, to I my think that's a good people. idea. Um, you see, you, you've been sitting on this for a long time, as you said. And in a sense, does it feel like a relief that it's out now in the open and the Band-Aid's been ripped off? Or is it still too raw to see it that way? Yeah, it, it doesn't feel like a relief. Um it it definitely doesn't. And the more messages I get, I just think the human race, I think sometimes people can learn to be a little bit nicer to one another, you know. Um, just don't be so horrible to people in their dark darkest days because you never know what that person's gone through and um, what they what they still have to go through. So like today I got, I just saw some things that made me like almost consider just like offing myself, you know, and, and these people, I've never met them in my life, but you know, if you just press on someone who has a dark mind or a dark thought process at the time, it's not good. Yeah. When you say things, you mean like comments on social media or comments online? Hmm. Yeah, things like that don't help, and um, I'm going to completely exit exit the social media world for just a little bit. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll yeah, do my best. You, have you got a therapist over there or a good support network? I I was staying with one of my close friends. Um, he's a great. Um, He's a great psychologist, but we were recently in a car accident and he broke his kneecap and um, he, yeah, he's back in New Zealand now. So I think I'll be calling him a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's always supporter here in, in, here in New Zealand. You know, you just want to be safe, um, both emotionally and mentally so, and physically. So whether that's in Kenya or here, just, um, yeah, just know that you, you still have like, people in New Zealand that love you and support you and care about you even though you're fucked up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of hard to see through the bullshit right now and actually see that. But um, when, when I do, it really, it really lifts me up for a little while. Do you have a message to fans or any kids or teens who look up to you and see you as a role model? Well, like, even if it's like a, a, a message of caution or warning? Yeah, I would, I would, I definitely would tell them um, I'm really sorry that I let them all down. Um, And I just want to, um, I want to tell them that this wasn't my whole career. I mean, from, from my standpoint, I still stand the same on the topic. And I always want to, um, I always wanted to do my best for everyone who looked up to me in that in such a way, yeah. and I'm sorry. Well, I was going to ask you how you'd like to be uh, like to be remembered as this chapter of your career closes, but I feel like you just sort of answered that really in a way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess being remembered for um, not not just for the not just for the running side of things, not for running fast, not for running records or anything like that, just for um kind of having a dream and giving it a real shot, giving it a go, and giving it one hundred percent you know despite everyone telling us that you can't do this, this isn't possible, so that's what I'd like to be remembered for, I think that that in a life sense, away from sport even, that makes, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I like that. Well, Zane Robertson, you're, um, I mean, you've done a bad thing. You know that. You're already beating yourself up enough about that, but you're a good person, and uh, I don't want you to forget that. 
Everyone makes mistakes. It's how you bounce back that matters, I think. Yeah, sadly, if I bounce back, it won't be in the limelight, but um, that's okay too. Oh, there's a know. lot more to life than that. Yeah, I, I just want you to remember you're, you're fucking young on the, big, on the big scheme of life. So the running, the running part of your life may be over or it may not be. That's up to you. But there's still a lot of good years left, okay? And I want you to remember that. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I want to get back to my roots and just enjoy sport for what it is, like actual fitness and fun. And I still have a lot of runners out there who are fun runners and club-level athletes who just want to do a marathon with me one day. So that, that will become more mm. of my aim. So when you say like fun run pace, what sort, of, what sort of marathon pace are you talking about? What's like a, a casual Zane Robertson fun run pace for a marathon? Two and a half? And it's, it's whatever they want to do. <laughs> if they want to go two and a half, I'll go two and a oh, half. Oh, bro. I... <laughs> I think, yeah, I think anything below 220 is starting to push it. <laughs> Oh my God, I think you would, you would struggle. You would struggle to run a marathon with me at the pace that I'm running at. It would just be, you'd fall asleep. You'd fall asleep on the, on the, on the road. No, man, you, you'd motivate me. I'd be chatting to yeah, you the whole yeah. way. Hey, well, listen, you're a good person and you've got a, a lot to offer and a lot of lessons that you can offer to other people. And um, I just want to thank you very much for chatting today and, um, and I wish you well. And I know the next, the next you know, days and weeks and even months, there's going to be dark moments. And there's going to be um, hopefully some light moments as well. But um, as the time passes, you know, the, the light moments will get more than the dark moments. And um, you just need to remember that. It's probably a message that you've, uh, or a mantra that you've told yourself many times in the dark spots of races. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah, definitely. Um, in, in with the positive and out with the negative right now. It's... Um... I've beat myself up a lot over the last months, and um, I, I don't need to. I don't need to do it anymore. Um, I'll, I'll probably have to do it for the next eight years of my life, as it is. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for chatting with me. Dan. I appreciate it, Zane. Zane Robertson in Kenya. Um, take care. Go easy on yourself. Life's hard for all of us, and for anyone that's listening to this or watching this. Um, there's no need to go on social media and tell him he's a piece of shit. He's already telling himself that enough. If anything right now, he could probably do with your support and your love and your care. Zane, look after yourself, mate. Thanks, Dom.